I'd like to start with a few Bible promises this morning, then we'll have prayer. John 14, 27, the Bible says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. What a beautiful promise. One other one, as we live in a world that seems to be constantly turning and churning and changing, Psalm 45, verse 6, the Bible says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. You know, people change. Some for the good. <laughs> some for the bad. But God doesn't change. Never changes. Never, ever changes. This throne never moves. We can always count on that. I remember as a high school senior, as my teacher would discuss Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung and Abraham Maslow and some guy by the name of Erickson, I don't even remember his first name, but you know, after every one of those, I would raise my hand as an 18-year-old young man, and I'd say, is what that man said absolute? Can I count on it? That's where I was as an 18-year-old young man. I didn't have a clue, not a clue. But I knew I wanted something that wouldn't change. I knew I wanted something that would always, not sometimes, not occasionally, not part-time, but would always be there. Always the same. And to every question that I asked my teacher, she always said, oh no, somebody else came along and showed that the guy didn't know what he was talking about. And so I was frustrated, frustrated again, until I read those verses in Psalms 45 where the psalmist said, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. It's not going to change. This world's getting crazy. God's still on His throne. He's still at the helm. People around us can get weird. God has not changed. He hasn't moved. He's still there. We can count on Him. Amen. We can count on Him. Let's kneel for prayer for those who are able. Father in heaven, we're thankful today for your word that's always dependable, always trustworthy, always, always sure. We thank you for that today. We pray for the Holy Spirit as we study together this morning that we would be strengthened, that we would be encouraged, that we would be uplifted so that we can be a blessing to somebody else. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning we're going to be looking at part 8 in our series called Prophecy Arise. Of course we had part 9 of our other series that we're doing simultaneously two weeks ago called The Woman of Ill Repute. You know, it dawned on me and that's how it typically happens when you give a sermon on a subject. It dawned on me after the sermon was over that there were, what, two to three million 
Seventh-day Adventists outside of Jericho? That's how many there were with Joshua, wasn't it? Two to three million? But you know what, folk? <laughs> locked in the pinky, locked in the pinky of that woman of ill repute in Jericho was more faith in her little pinky nail. There was more faith in her pinky nail than in two to three million Israelites, wasn't there? Um, we got to be real careful, folks. <laughs> we got to be real careful. Because as I was sharing last Sabbath in Atlanta, you know, how many people would look upon Rahab and say, she's just a beepity beep beep ho. I mean, come on, that's what she was, wasn't she? And you know what? The God of heaven had been preparing her for 40 years. For 40 years, folk. You remember when the spies came in, they said, Rahab said, we heard, we heard what your God did in parting the Red Sea. We heard that story. Folk, that happened 40 years prior to the Israelites surrounding Jericho. So for 40 years, the God of heaven was working with this young woman as she went from teen to young adult to a life of ill repute. But I'm sure a lot of people would look, had looked down their nose at her and said, oh, she's just a, she's a hoe. When at that very moment, there was more faith in that woman's life, in her little nail, than among the Adventists outside of the city. Now that, that's something, that's something that we need to think about, folks. Need to think about that. What an awesome story. I love that series on Amazing Grace. Love that story. Now, if I can just find my clicker, we'll get going here. No, that's not it, Selma. Let's see here. Check the pockets. No, that's my cell phone. I've apparently lost it in this pocket. <laughs> All right. Order out of chaos. Order out of chaos. Let's see what we're looking at here this morning. Oh, we're having all kinds of fun up here, aren't we? Try it again. There we go. There was a guy in Germany. His name was George Friedrich Hegel. Born around the time of the American Revolution, died around 1831. He had a philosophy of history that's used very much today. It's called the Hegelian dialectic, or order out of chaos. It's really very simple. You take an idea, you take a problem that you have, you create something that's the opposite of it, they clash. And when the clash gets bad enough, then you come forward with your solution. It's called thesis, antithesis, synthesis. How it's used? Well, it's being used today to create a climate for a Sunday law. But it's also been used in the not too recent past his ideas are simple. You have an objective or something you want to accomplish. The way to achieve it is to create trouble bad enough so that people will start looking for a solution. And when the troubles get bad enough, you start offering the solution that you had in mind all along. 
You get what you want. The people have no idea that that was what you wanted in the first place. The people are simply pawns doing exactly what the master mind says. Isn't that diabolical? You create the problem, and when it gets bad enough and people are ripe for it, then you say, I've got the perfect solution. So you handle both sides. Both sides. Like 9-11, Faye, that's exactly right. We're going to look at it. This is the first one, though, when we've seen it in modern time. You remember that building in Oklahoma? That's pretty close to where Dave and Donald and Selma were just recently in Oklahoma. Texas, Oklahoma. 1995, folks. The Alfred P. Murrah Building in Oklahoma City, well, there you see it right there. Now, people have said, well, it was because of Timothy McVeigh's ammonium nitrate bomb that was in that uh, Ryder U-Haul truck out on the street. Well, a bomb specialist of 30 years, a man by the name of Benton K. Parton, came along and said it was impossible for a bomb in that truck to do that damage. He said the only way the Murrah building could have been demolished like that was because there were bombs inside the building at key points. And that's what caused the destruction. So now we've got this horrible problem. A bombing in Oklahoma City. You say, wait a minute. You know, if it's in New York City or Miami or Detroit or Los Angeles, we can say, okay, they, they just seem to, to bear weirdos. But Oklahoma City? That's in the heartland of America. Weirdos don't spawn themselves out in the Midwest. Well, let's see how this happened. Watch what Hegel's ideas how they came to fruition. The president at that time was a man named Bill Clinton who was trained at Georgetown University, the preeminent Jesuit school in America. There was anti-terrorism legislation that he and his mentors, the Jesuits, wanted passed through Congress. But that legislation would seriously gut freedom in America. Well, here comes Hegel's ideas. Number one, this is what you do. Your thesis, you create terror in America. The antithesis, you blame some right-wing weirdos like Timothy McVeigh. And I think the other guy's name was Nickel. And what's your solution? What did you want to have happen all along? Well, you wanted to pass legislation. Well, folk, that's exactly what happened. They created terror in Oklahoma City. The Jesuits and Clinton created the terror in Oklahoma City. They blamed it on Timothy McVeigh. And then the legislation passed right through Congress. Right through. Repeated statements from the Orlando Sentinel. This is uh, April 21, 1995. It says the Omnibus Counterterrorism Act of 1995 was on a slow track in Congress and the subject of a lively debate as to whether it would violate some fundamental civil liberties, including the right to confront one's accuser. So there was the problem. There were certain fundamental civil liberties that would come under attack if it was passed. So the Congress was backing away from it and saying, no, 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 we're not going to pass that Omnibus Counterterrorism Act. But after the Oklahoma City bombing, there are a few sure legislative bets in Washington. Democrats and Republicans issued news releases Thursday calling for the bill's quick passage. Mission accomplished. You created chaos. You created terror. You blamed it on some right-wing weirdo. 
And then you came forward with exactly what you wanted to accomplish. Destroying civil liberty. Happened that exact way. Exact way. Well, that's a whole other issue. Was it used here? Well, Faye, Faye already told us it was. And absolutely, Faye, it happened that exact same way with the bombing of, with the planes flying into the World Trade Center. How did they do it? Well, Rome and the Jesuits have hated the Protestant West and fundamental Islam. They hate Protestant liberty in the Constitution. So there was their problem. How do you destroy constitutional liberty in America and go after fundamental Islam at the same time? Now here's a statement that shows their hate for the Constitution from Avril Manhattan's book, The Dollar and the Vatican, page 26. He said, The Vatican condemned the Declaration of Independence as wickedness and called the Constitution of the United States a satanic document. So the Constitution of the United States is hated by the Vatican. They hate it. They want to destroy it. So what do you do? Well, you go into the World Trade Center, you create this attack, and what did they get out of it? Well, they destroyed Protestant liberty, They've been in the process of destroying fundamental Islam. They want to rule the world from Jerusalem, and they want to keep drug money flowing from Afghanistan. Now those were the objectives. What chaos do you create to reach those goals? Well, there it is, folk, right there. That's what they created. They created chaos. That's what the Jesuits created in order to get these solutions. Paul? They, uh, 92, they tried to blow up the uh, World Trade Centers. They had bombs there. They didn't go off. Exactly the same way they did the Merle I mean, That was the blind sheet. You just went to trial or what? And, uh, yeah. And McVeigh was the only public execution that wasn't public. He's still out there. He worked for the government since he was 17. You bet, Paul. Now that, that bombing, Paul, that was in 92? It was 92 or right there somewhere. Okay. And it was very quiet they, until it started gaining. You heard more about it after this than you did when it happened. Okay. But that guy, I believe, went to, they, they arrested him in 92. It was right there, right there. So, Reggie, do you know? Was it 92? It was right there, just before this. Okay. 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 It might have been lighter than that, Bill, but you know, forget about that. Right, right. Appreciate the comment, Paul. Folk, there is a concerted effort on the part of the Catholic Church and the Jesuit order to create chaos, to create fear. And when they do that, then people are ripe and ready for a solution. And people will do just about anything in order for that solution to be gained. But they create the chaos, they create the chaos so that people will look for an answer to this. Fundamental Islam is being ravaged in the Middle East. The most powerful Middle East leader is removed from his throne. Of course, that was Saddam Hussein. A message was sent. Get in line or you're going to be gone too. As things continue to deteriorate in the Middle East, there will be a cry for a peacemaker to come to the region to bring peace. I wonder who that could be. And of course, drug money is flowing from Afghanistan and the Constitution is in shambles. You know, folk, all three of these, we've seen three, four, and one. Those have already taken place. They're happening as we speak. The Constitution is in shambles. 
even this week after the yesterday after the Supreme Court said that uh, same sex marriage was okay, the President of the United States says, Now I am convinced that we are following the Constitution of America that all men are created equal. What? Well, Nellie, in Nellie's question was, shouldn't we be happy that that's happening? In in a sense, Nellie, yes, we should. Right, right. We should be happy because we know that they are creating this immorality and this chaos within the family unit, which will eventually, Nellie, lead to a backlash in the United States. And that backlash will, will become religious fanaticism. So yes, we should be happy, Nellie, because this is a part of the fulfilling of Bible prophecy. In another sense, Nellie, to see the demise and the destruction, which is what the Jesuits on the Supreme Court want for America, is to destroy this great nation, that kills me inside as an American. Absolutely it is, Nellie. <coughs> Absolutely. This number two, though, folks, this is the one that we haven't seen yet, but I guarantee you it's going to happen because for the last 1,800 years, the Vatican has wanted to rule the world from Jerusalem. So as things continue to deteriorate in the Middle East, we will hear a cry for a peacemaker to come to that region of the world. And it will be this man if he's still around. So um, that's the goal, folks. And that, that's the only one of, those three point, of these four points that we still don't see is number two. But I guarantee you it's on its way. Well, this slide's a little bit tiny, but from the Orlando Sentinel, right after September 11th, this was what the assault was, all, was not all about, but this was one leg of the 9-11 attacks. Notice the Orlando Sentinel, Wednesday, September 12th. That's just a day after the Twin Towers went down. The media's already hypnotizing and controlling how people think and they're going to tell you what their solution is. Here it is. There's much work to be done. It will involve much more spending and planning, hardening of key facilities and perhaps higher taxes and what? Forfeiture of some personal freedoms. That was the whole objective, Donald, right there. It's the whole one of the major objectives, there were several, but forfeiture of personal freedoms. Folks, that's an assault on the Constitution. Here's another statement. This is from USA Today, Thursday, September 13th. See, folk, it just pop, 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 pop. We want to get this point across. As the United States faces a new war against uncertain and hidden enemies, the temptation to sacrifice our freedom. There it is. Here's another one. The challenge is to meet those threats without endangering our constitutional character or undermining the freedom and liberty that are the source of our power. This was one of the major outward focuses of 9-11, destroy the Constitution. And that, of course, came about with the New Patriot Act from Reuters News Service, October 26, 2001. It says the bill enhances the ability of federal authorities to tap phones, share intelligence information, track internet usage, emails, and cell phones, and protect U.S. borders. 
you know, I probably have said this before, but, you know, I'll have people call me on my cell phone and they'll say, um, I want to order those books that you wrote about those J's. And I'll say, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I, you must have the wrong number. I didn't write any books about birds. And they say, oh, no, no, I didn't mean books about birds. I said, but you said it was about J's. And they say, oh, but you, you know what I mean. It's the, you know, the, you know the, those people that, that are J's that start. And then I'll say, oh, you mean those books I wrote about the Jesuit order in the Catholic Church? And they'll go, mm-hmm. Now, why do people act that way? It's because they're scared. And why are they scared? It's because of the New Patriot Act right here. That's why they're scared, folks. What's that, Reggie? Absolutely. And that's what people are afraid of. They're scared. Lawmakers upset with some of the administration's anti-terrorism actions will question Attorney General John Ashcroft on the matter. Certain congressmen say the administration's actions have gone too far in infringing on civil liberties. In that same paper in USA Today, a couple of months after 9-11, there were two children at a Christmas tree decorating it, and the one at the top was singing, He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good. And the child at the bottom in the caption, he says, Stop talking about Attorney General Ashcroft like that. Folk, it's a joke, isn't it? It's a, it's a funny little joke. You remember that, Dennis? Okay. What's the point? The point is... Because of the new Patriot Act, because of 9-11, government knows what you're doing, when you're doing it, what you say, when you say it, and who you're saying it to. Now again, as Nellie brought out a moment ago, is this cause for rejoicing? On the one hand, absolutely it is. Because it tells us where we are. It also tells us, folk, the method that is being used repeatedly by the papacy and the Jesuits to destroy this nation. They've been doing it for, for decades. For decades, folk. Adolf Hitler had a problem in Germany back in 1933. He wanted to destroy the liberties of Germany. Well, he had some people that were causing trouble in Germany. They were called communists. So, Adolf Hitler said, okay, what can we do now? Let's use the Hegelian dialectic, he and his Jesuit advisors. So they created chaos in Germany. This is the Reichstag burning in 1933. Well, Adolf Hitler got exactly what he wanted. Chaos. Trouble in Germany. Who did he blame it on? He blamed it on communists. And because people were so afraid of what the communists had done to the Reichstag building in burning it, the day after that happened, Adolf Hitler came forward with legislation in Germany that obliterated German freedoms. Just like Bill Clinton, just like George Bush. Here's some of them. It says Hitler prevailed on President Hindenburg to sign a decree for the protection. It's always for the protection of the people in the state. We're going to protect you. Just like what I heard uh, yesterday, that the President of the United States 
wants, we want to be protected from the, the, the weirdos like that young man that walked into that church in, in Charleston, South Carolina and started shooting people. So how do we protect America? Well, it's simple. Everybody bring in your guns. No more weapons. Then everybody will be protected. Folk, whenever guns are collected, the only people that carry them are outlaws. It's always for the protection of the people. In actuality, it's for the destruction of the people. It was this folk right here. It was the Reichstag fire, the chaos that ensued. It is that which led to Dachau, Bergen-Belsen, Auschwitz, and the annihilation of six million Jews. It started right here. Right here. It says, suspending seven sections of the Constitution which guaranteed individual and civil liberties. Described as a defensive measure against communist acts of violence, endangering the state. The decree laid down that restrictions on personal liberty, on the right of free expression of opinion, including freedom of the press, the rights of assembly and association, violations of the privacy of postal, telegraphic and phone communications, and warrants for house searches on property. The German people weren't protected anymore. They had no more freedom. And Hitler used chaos that he created to give the people the solution. No more freedom. Same thing happened in Vietnam. In South Vietnam, the leader of South Vietnam was a man named No Dung Diem. Used the exact same process in Saigon. From Avril Manhattan's book, Vietnam, Why Did We Go? He says this, The next year, October 1956, he promulgated a new constitution imitating Mussolini, Hitler, and Pavelic of Croatia. He inserted an Article 98 which gave him full dictatorial power. The article read in part as follows, During the first legislative term, the president may decree a temporary suspension of there followed almost all the liberties of the nation to meet the legitimate demands of public security. Now, folks, how can it be that Hitler in 33, that Diem in 56, that Pavelic in Croatia did the same thing in the 1940s, and then Bill Clinton... And George Bush did it in America. How could it be that those five or six leaders in all these different countries could do the exact same thing? How'd that happen? A coincidence? That's kind of like those Timex watches. You know, you take it all apart and you've got several hundred pieces and you throw it up in the air, and it comes back down, and it lands on the table, and it's a watch. Come on, folk. It's not a coincidence. Rome worked through all these men, and they're doing the same thing in America today. Hitler, the Reichstag, 1933, DM, South Vietnam in the 50s and 60s, Clinton, 1995, Bush, 2001. There's only one common denominator. It all came from the think tank that emanated from Vatican City. The Bible says in Revelation 17, 18, the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. And the papal power is the woman 
that controls the leaders of this world, controls Barack Obama, controlled George Bush, controlled Bill Clinton, Diem, Pavelich, and Adolf Hitler. A priest in the Western Watchman back over a hundred years ago said the Pope rules the world. The emperors, the kings, the princes, the presidents are as these altar boys of mine. And how about order from chaos now? What a tragedy. What a tragedy that occurred in Charleston, South Carolina last week. What a tragedy. People were killed in cold blood. What a tragedy. The smoldering flames of race surfaces again, folks. It's chaos. It's chaos. It's upheaval. Trying to create, trying to create a bloodbath in America. That's what they're doing. Why? Why creating this, this tension and stress and violence? Why? Because they've got their solution. They've got their solution waiting. We've got the answer for this for these terrible situations. What's that, Nelly? Absolutely, Nelly. It's they scientific people say that the greatest motive for why people do things is fear. It's fear. It's not principle. It's fear. And fear is not of God, Donald. No, it's not. So they create fear. And with this tragic tragedy, this insanity, from last week in Charleston, South Carolina, created tension, violence, anger, and fear. The president, in the light of what happened, called for stricter gun control laws. How many times have we heard that from five presidents over the last 30 years. How many times? From 1981 when uh, Ronald Reagan was shot by that John Hinckley Jr. How many times, folk, have we heard the way that we will be safe is if we make stricter gun laws so that people no longer can carry guns? Well, that's one of the amendments. That's the second amendment to the Constitution. So, by taking away people's guns, that's going to make it so some crazy doesn't do that? It's not going to change that, folks. But the point is, you create the chaos, then you provide the solution. Give up your guns. And eventually, Nelly, out of fear, guns will go. Guns will go. In order to be safe, we need to give up our guns. And yesterday, the Supreme Court declared that same-sex couples have a right to marry anywhere in the United States a historic culmination of decades of litigation over gay marriage and gay rights generally. Gay and lesbian couples already could marry in 36 states and the District of Columbia. The court's 5-4 to four ruling means the remaining 14 states will have to stop enforcing their bans on same-sex marriage. 
Now tell me something. What do you think will be the result? What will be the fallout or the consequences of this ruling? Do you, do you think that fundamental Christian people, do you think they're going to agree with this, folks? No. No, they're not. They are not. So do you think that they will just quietly disagree with this and go about their business? No, they will not. Already we found in a recent Prophecy Arise sermon that there were many states that were passing Religious Freedom Restoration Acts which said, because of my religious freedom, I'm not going to accept and approve of yours. So folk, these men and women, six of them that are Roman Catholic, two of them that are members of the Council on Foreign Relations, which is a Jesuit secret front, eight out of nine of them are subservient to the Vatican. The other one has no religious or political tie to any clear group at this point. I'm not sure, Nellie. I am not sure. I think it might be this one, Kagan. Yeah. Um, Roberts, of course, is a Knight of Malta and a devout Catholic. Scalia, Thomas... Um, devout Catholics. So, uh, Kennedy, devout Catholic. So, um, we've got here, folk, these, these folks that are now promoting and saying it's a law of this land for same-sex marriage. I guarantee it, folk, if God allows... This will bring upheaval and chaos to America. No doubts. No doubts. What's that, Nelly? They uphold it. Yes. They support it. It makes you wonder, Nelly, who, who, which people were polled. Yes, I never was. Yeah, yeah. So, Ma'am. Sheila, it's a good question. Where would I stand if somebody came into the church that was wanting to be married and they were of the same sex? First off, Sheila, I would typically when somebody does something like that, Sheila, they want to play a game. Um, so I'd play with them. I'd play their game. And I'd say, you know, um, I don't do very many marriages. And... Um, Number one, in order for there to be uh, two people to come together, you know, we'd have to be on the same page. And so I'd say I would need a, quite a bit of time in order up for us to get on the same page. Typically, Sheila, if you um, tell somebody there's a period of waiting, they're not interested in waiting. You see? And so they just fly out of here. Now, Sheila, if, if somebody then wants to play with me and they're here over a many-month period, at the end of that time, Sheila, I would say, you know, um, I just don't feel uh, comfortable under these circumstances to marry you. And that's what I would say. So in the beginning, Sheila, I would try to blow them off. Uh, by playing a game with them. If they continue to play with me, then I eventually would say, I will not do it. 
That's what I do. What's that, Nellie? Biblically, I could not do it. No, I can't. What's that, Dennis? Well, Dennis, um, I don't know, Dennis, if they, if they said, no, you have to do it. Well, Right, right. Dennis, if, if they didn't take no for an answer, then, um, and they, they pushed it beyond, then obviously in the light of the climate in the United States, then there would be a consequence. And um, Dennis, I'd be willing to accept that consequence. So, chaos, folk. Encouraging racial violence, using it to take away people's rights to have guns, creating a filthy climate that will lead to judgments upon this land and then bringing a solution. You know, folk, it's very, very possible. I'm not saying it's a guarantee, but it's very possible that because of the hundreds of Al-Qaeda cells that are already in existence in the United States of America today. It's very, very possible that because America has legally said yes to same-sex marriage, we know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. We know that they were destroyed because they promoted that lifestyle. Folk, it's very possible it's very possible that because of this decision made yesterday that the God of heaven would allow the Jesuit order through the Al-Qaeda cells to create terror in this country. Because you see, folk, when a country agrees to same-sex marriage, God can't protect that. And God won't protect that. And so now, because of the Supreme Court decision, it has left this country wide open for any and every possible form of judgment that the God of heaven would allow on this nation. That's what it's brought, folks. And of course, the Al-Qaeda cells that Rome has trained through the Catholic Intelligence Agency could be used to create those judgments, which will then bring America to looking for a solution. We're repeating history. The world has no solutions. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only solution. But folk... As judgments will come for the encouragement of same-sex marriages, a solution, a solution will be looked for. That will be Sunday. There's no doubt about it. But the only solution to the world's problems, the only one, will be the second coming of Christ. This is the only answer. Great Controversy 587 says that the answer that the Christian world will come forth with is this. The very class puts forth the claim that the fast-spreading corruption is largely attributable to the desecration of the so-called Christian Sabbath. That the enforcement of Sunday observance would greatly improve the morals of society. This claim is especially urged in America where the doctrine of the true Sabbath has been most widely preached. So, folk, this will be the answer to the fast-spreading corruption that we see in our world today. Praise God that we live on the brink of eternity and the second coming of Christ. Let us pray.
Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for the great controversy theme. Thank you for that awesome book. Thank you for your word that has laid out what's ahead. Thank you that these things are clear. And thank you, Father, that these will stand as a shield against the hellish darts of the enemy. I just pray, Lord, that you would strengthen each one of us to stand, to stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us and to fight your battles when champions are few. Bless us all to that end. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.